goodness. I tell you, the beginning, the Bible says that the, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, which it, it doesn't mean that I've got to be petrified or fearful of God. It just means a respectful awe. And I look at the Lord with awe, with respect, with honor, realizing how powerful and, and, uh, and how involved in my life the Lord is. And that's the beginning of wisdom because that's the beginning of understanding what, that God plays a major part in, in all of our lives. And so thank you guys. That's so awesome. I'm, I'm serious. I, uh, we start the year 2018 with another demonstration of the Lord's blessing in, in our lives by uh, having wonderful people to lead us and uh, to sing to the Lord. One of the things that I love, of course, I'm, I, it reveals my generation, I'm sure, is I love hymns. Uh, I grew up with hymns. I know a lot of hymns by heart, you know, and, uh, and I just kind of break into them at almost any time. And if I forget the words, I just make up words to go in there. But, uh, but I love them. But hymns generally, and this is just a general statement, hymns generally are songs about the Lord. If, if, you, if you look at them and hear, hear them as you sing them and look at the words, they're songs that talk about God, you know, how great thou art. That's talking about God, you know, or, or uh, any of the others. Just, just think about them. A lot of our praise songs and a lot of the worship songs that we do are songs that talk to the Lord. Here's my heart, Lord, you know, uh, take it. And, and, and you're talking to the Lord not necessarily just about the Lord. It's just a different kind of a feel to it. No odds between the two. I think they both have a wonderful place, and uh, thankful our band, they just kind of flow in and out of all of that, and we, we love it, and it's awesome. And so we find ourselves at the beginning of 2018 looking down the barrel of the book of James. <laughs> How many of you feel like, boy, the barrel the, 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 uh, is on me? I mean, I mean, you know, the bead is on me, right? Yeah, God has found me, and I don't have anywhere else to go. I just have to face the music, so to speak, in the book of James. Uh, and James is one of those people that I think many of us would not feel comfortable to be around. And the reason I say that is if you've ever been around a person that, is, that, that will not just allow you to stand there and believe something, they're going to challenge what you believe. And they're basically going to demand that you reflect what you believe by the way you live. And if you've ever been around a person like that, it can be uncomfortable a lot of times, right? <laughs> it's like, if you do, do you want good children or do you want godly children? If you ask Christians that, many Christians will say, hey, bless the Lord, I want godly kids. Well, I'm not so sure you want godly kids. I, I think you probably want good kids. Good kids make good grades in school. Good kids honor their parents. Good kids clean up their room. Good kids... Uh, get on the bus, get in the thing right, uh, obey and follow the rules and so forth. Godly kids, on the other hand, challenge what happens in the home. Uh, Dad, why are you listening to that? That doesn't uh, exalt Christ. Why are we watching that on TV? That's not something God would be pleased with. Why don't we live what we say we believe? I mean, godly kids. James is the kind of person that would expect us to be a reflection of God. If he lives in your life, he's going to show up in the way you behave. If there's something wrong with, the, with your life and the way you practice your life, there's something wrong with your life. If your faith doesn't change you and the way you act and think and believe and walk and the things you do... Uh, Something's wrong with that faith. It's just a, it's just a, a, real, a real binding thing in your life that uh, you can't just talk a good game. You, gotta, you have to live what you talk. So old camel knees would make us feel uncomfortable, I'm sure, uh, for the most part, to be, to be around him all the time in our life. Um, even his name, even his nickname, Old Camel Knees, that he got by spending so much time on his knees in prayer that people would catch him praying all the time 
in the temple bowed on his knees asking the Lord to bless his people and to unburden his people, praying for the churches, praying for Christ to be real in the world. And people would walk in and he would be on his knees praying and he soon got the nickname Old Camel Knees because he spent most of his life on his knees. I don't know about you, but if I'm going to read, if I, if I want somebody to give me instructions on how to be a Christian, it would certainly be someone who spend his life on his knees before the Lord. That's the kind of person I could study after. That's the kind of person I'd like to hear what they have to say about what a relationship with the Lord is like. And so here we are in the book of James. Now, it's been about a month since we've been here, and we were really uh, starting in chapter 2, which kind of starts right in the middle of of a, of a whole flow of information and thoughts and so forth. None of us ever start a sentence like just walk up to you and I just walk up to Wesley and say, and you know what else? <laughs> you know, or uh, therefore, here's what my summary is. No, I mean, who starts a sentence with things like that? Nobody does. So let's go back and, and let's just kind of filter through and see what James said. So when we get to the actual new stuff like you have on your outline, uh, it might actually kind of have a little bit of impact on us. So let's just look. I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not going to take a lot of time in this. I promise you. James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the first, first, first chapter. James doesn't pull rank. James doesn't say James, a brother of Jesus, and James, the great leader of the church, and great, the great James, the great pastor. He doesn't. He just. He doesn't boast about himself. Doesn't brag about himself. Doesn't try to elevate himself. So you'll listen to what he has to say. He said, look, I'm just like you. You know what I am? I'm a bond servant to Jesus Christ. That's what I am. And I'm writing to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. At the time James was writing, there were no, basically, there were no Gentile Christians. They were all Jewish Christians. They were all people that were Jewish people of the 12 tribes of Israel that had come to Christ. We, we would call that today a completed Jew. Uh, a, a Jew that had received Jesus as their Messiah, like Jesus intended for it to be. You know, the Bible said he came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. I mean, I was talking, he came to his own. Jesus was Jewish. Jesus was born Jewish. He had Jewish disciples. He lived in a Jewish society. But they rejected him, and they hung him on a cross and and spit in his face and stuck spear in his side and rejected him. But there were some who believed, and and they were scattered all over the world. And so James says, I'm writing to you Christians. Uh, I'm writing to the ones who know the Lord. I'm writing to every believer of every day, of every age who trusts Christ and knows Christ. And though you may be scattered and you may feel like you are lost to history, nobody knows your name Nobody knows where you are. The scattered tribes, though you may be lost to the world, they don't know you, they don't know about you, they don't know any where you are. You are not lost to God. God knows where you are. God knows your name. And so I'm writing to everybody who loves the Lord, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Look at your neighbor say, multi-shaded pirates, all right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's that, that's the, the the various trials is an attempt to translate the word uh, one of the words parismos, which we get our word pirate. And I talked to you about that. That that trials are like pirates. Uh, if any of you've ever into the genre of you know of the pirate and the buccaneer and the Caribbean stuff and all that Caribbean stuff and. And, um, and, and you're into that kind of genre, you know what happens. Uh, pirates just appear out of nowhere, suddenly, unexpectedly, without notice. They just pop on the horizon. James says that's what trials do in our life. They're, 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 they have all these different shades. They're not, you know, just green and red and yellow and blue. And, uh, they, they're, they're combinations of green and yellow and blue and, and red. And uh, I mean, they're just multi-shaded And if you've ever been through a trial, you'd say yes to that because you'd know what happens in trials. New stuff happens in trials, right? 
And they seem to be synchronized with one another because, you, you know, rarely would you just go through one. You, they, they seem to, to be personalized for you. I'm just saying that because whatever may be a trial for me might not be one for you. I might look at you and say, what's the problem? That's, that doesn't seem to be a big deal. But to you, it's a big deal. And so the Lord knows what kind of things are big deals to you and what kind are big deals for me. And he develops these uh, challenges, these pirates that pop into our life. And I submit to you that unless it pops into your life like a pirate, it is not a trial. It is not a test. It has to be sudden. It has to be unexpected. It has to be something that you're not prepared for, else it wouldn't be a test. Right? It would be an examination. If God said, all right, prepare for this, and here it comes, and in a week it'll be here, and you better get ready for it, and then when it happens, you're ready for it, well, great, you were prepared for it, so you you examined well, but whenever all of a sudden, like a pop test, it just pops into your life, it becomes a real test because it's sudden and unexpected, and so James says, count it joy when this happens to you. It's a privilege for God to honor you enough to say, I believe in you enough that I'm going to send this into your life and I'm going to open the door and allow these things, this pirate to come sailing into your life because when it does, it's going to make you even stronger than you are now. So you can be joyful about that thing. You're not thanking God and being full of joy for what happened. Oh, my wife left me. Thank God. Glory to God. I've been waiting for that to happen. You know, my uncle died. Well, praise the Lord. Glory to God. No, 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 no. no. You're not thanking God for the pirate that sailed in. You're thanking God for what that's going to do in your life. And so James says, hey, count it all joy when you fall into these multi-shaded pirates knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Why can I be joyful? Because I know something. Look at your neighbor and say, not because you believe, but because you know something. It doesn't say, you know, uh, believing that testing of your faith produces patience, or here's a better one, feeling. (laughs) Feeling. It doesn't say feeling that the testing of your faith produces patience. You're not going to feel your way to success when trials pop into your life. That's why he doesn't say feeling. He says, I got to know something. So when things pop into my life, if I'm going to make it through them, it's because I know something. What do I know? James says that patience does something in my life. Whenever, whenever my, when my multi-shaded pirate jumps into my life, uh, it's going to do something in me. And so knowing that this is going to do something in me, I can be joyful about this. I can say, thank God, there's something tremendous about to happen in my life. Thank God, there's something new about, God's about to introduce something new in me. God wants me to be productive and to be great and to be powerful and to be strong and be prepared and be ready for things in life. God wants my life to reflect the image of Jesus Christ. That's why he created me. And here is another opportunity for God to perfect that in my life. So thank God I know what it is. And see, you can't Thank God for trials if you just think you're going to feel good about them. You have to know some stuff in order to rejoice in the middle of a trial and let patience have its perfecting work. We all know that none of us are going to be perfect this side of heaven, right? Look at your neighbor and say, I'm not perfect. And I'm not going to be until Jesus makes me perfect, (laughs) right? There's no real argument about that, right? I'm not perfect. I, I want to be perfect. I plan to be. I'm moving toward. I, I, I would love to be. That's, that, that's my goal. That's my aim. But I know that that's not going to happen this side of heaven, right? When I get to heaven, Jesus is going to make me perfect. But on this side, I can be striving toward it, but, I, but, but I'm not going to ever really reach that pre- precipice, and I'm not going to be really perfect in life. But... While I'm here on earth, God is perfecting. God is in the process of perfecting me toward himself. I know, uh, forgive me, just a little tiny break of theology here, all right? There are three tenses of, of, of salvation. There is the past tense. I was saved. 
There's the present tense, I'm in the process of being saved. And there is the future tense, I shall be saved. I, 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 even though right now I'm walking in the present, I'm in the process of God perfecting me, saving me, moving in me. But one of these days, he's going to complete his task and, and, I'm, and it's going to be glorification for me, you know. And so, so James is saying that. And, and so let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And if you want to know about what's happening in you, if anyone lacks wisdom, wisdom about what? Well, anything, but in this context, it's basically saying about the trial you're going through. I mean, you, you, you're wondering, hey, Lord, what about this pirate that just popped into my life? Why is it there? Did I do something wrong? I mean, is this a punishment or is this, what is this? How do I need to respond to this? What, what, what's going to be appropriate for me? Well, where do I go? What do I do? How do I view this? If, if, I, if I need wisdom about my trial, ask God. And James says, God will tell you because it's the nature of God to give. Just like it's the nature of light to shine and it's the nature of fire to produce heat. It's the nature of God to give. And so God is going to give when you ask him, and, and, and he's not going to beat you up about it. He's not going to condescend to you. He's not going to say, you don't know that. How long have you been a Christian, man? You, what, you are ignorant. No, no, God's not going to shame you when you expose the fact that you need to understand what's going through your life. And so here's God. Thank you, Isaac. Appreciate that, brother. How would you know I was dying? God... <laughs> God produces that in our life. All right. If any of you ask, uh, if any of you needs wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally and, and without reproach, and it'll be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. It's just saying whenever you do ask God about the trial, God, give me wisdom. God, help me know how to respond. Help me know how to walk. What, do I, what are my resources? Where do I go? Uh, how can I make it through this? What, how can I cooperate with you instead of fighting against you? You know, sometimes when we get in trials, I think we, we basically hold ourselves in that trial longer than we have to. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be there longer than I have to be, right? So I want to cooperate with the Spirit of God rather than fight against the Spirit of God so I can move quickly through the trial, you know. So I need to know how to do that. God, tell me how to do that. And so God says, I'll tell you if you'll ask me. You, later on in the book of James, and we'll see it, uh, he said in chapter 4, he said, you have not because you ask not. Right. He said, you have not because you ask not. And you ask and don't receive because you want to consume it on your own lust. I mean, come on. It boils down to that. And James said, you know, now don't, if, if, you're, going to, if you're going to believe like that, I, I wish I could draw this picture for you, but basically if you can just picture in your mind somebody sitting out in the middle of the ocean like a sea, like a wave. I mean, he's comparing it to the ocean. He's comparing it to a wave. And, 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 the, and the picture here is this. He said, if you're the kind of person that you're asking God for wisdom, but you have a lot of options, like you, you have an ocean of options, and you're sitting out in the middle of this ocean in your little boat with all of these options still open, trying to decide which one of these options am I going to take. Am I going to do what I want to do, or am I going to do what God tells me to do? Am I going to do what Mama wants? Uh, Daddy had a good thought. I mean, I, I'm in this ocean of, uh, of options. And James says, if you ask God for wisdom while you're still sitting in your rowboat in this ocean of options, as if, if I don't like God's choice, I can make another choice of my own. God, show me what it is so I can decide whether I want to go your way or my way. And we do that all the time, guys. We, we do. We, 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 want, we say we want God, but when God is not what, God's way is not what we want, 
or God's way is, is a different direction than what we thought it was going to be. When it doesn't work out like we have envisioned it working out, then we want to back away from God and try it our way. And James says, if you're in a rowboat sitting out in the ocean of options and you're asking God to show you something that you're not, that you still have the door open to doing your own thing, don't think God's going to give you an answer. Because you, you, you're, you're double-minded. You're unstable in all of your ways, not only spiritually, but financially and relationally and, and, and materially and physically. You are just a mess is what it boils down to. You can't make a decision. You can't, you can't have a choice. And it's not just about the things of God. It's about everything else in your life. I mean, look at people's lives. Have you seen people this way? I mean, don't point at them. It's kind of tacky, but, um, you know, just don't look at them either. Just kind of, you know, come straight ahead with your eyes, all right? Mm. But you look at them and you say, man, not only is your spiritual life a mess, everything else in your life is a mess. They're about to repossess the house. You can't manage your money. You make plenty of money or at least an adequate amount of money. Uh, how, why can't you make it? Because, you, you know, you're, you're double-minded. That's why. You're unstable in all of your ways. Why can't you keep a relationship with anybody? Why do you make poor choices? Why can't you, why can't you be stable? Because you're double-minded and you're unstable in all of your ways. With your family, you're always at odds with your family and everything's always up in the air and it's always controversial and it's always, you know, nobody really wants to be around you at, at Christmas time because somehow you can find a way to bring everybody down regardless of the joy of the season. What's wrong with you? You're double-minded. You're unstable in all your ways. You're up one minute and down the next. You're in one minute, you're out the next. James says... If you're sitting out in the middle of the ocean and you're asking God, tell me what's going on in my life and you have all these options still open, forget it. God ain't telling you anything. While you sit out there and pretend to be God making the decisions for yourself. That's what he says. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man. Nuts and bolts, guys. Look at your neighbor and say, nuts and bolts. I'm sorry. That's just is. All right. Let the brother of low degree uh, glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, which looks like double talk, and it just means, remember, we all go through one of two trials. Some of us even go through both of the trials, right? We have the trial of poverty, and we have the trial of plenty. Now, James says you're going to go through one of those, at least one of those. Some of you, like I said, have gone through both of them. There have been times when you have been impoverished where you are broke and don't have anything and, and it's a real trial to you because you feel like nobody cares about you. You come to church and nobody speaks to you and you get offended and you say, they don't like me down there. You jump to conclusions about stuff because you're crushed on the inside. Your spirit is crushed. The word, the brother of low degree, uh, the lowly brother, the word translated in Greek there means crushed. It means the brother who's been crushed. It means something's happened to him that has just devastated his life. It means he's been overwhelmed by whatever terrible thing has happened. I lost my maid. I went through a divorce. I, uh, you know, somebody that somebody uh, mistreated me. I lost all my money. I, I, I can't get a job. I got fired from a job. I got laid off from my job. I mean, there are lots of things that can literally crush us, can crush our ego, can crush our, our sense of well-being, our sense of purpose. And then when we walk into a group of people, we don't feel like we belong there. And we feel like everybody's looking down at us because that's the way we feel on the inside of us. James says when you feel that way, you can look up because you, even though your business may have put you down and your money may have put you down and your social life may have put you down and, and, and the prosperity may have put you down, there's something in you that's deeper than business and social life and money and prosperity. Man, you've been born into the family of God. You are son of the king. You're, you are washed in the blood of the lamb. You have a greater calling. You're going to heaven when you die. 
For after all, I'm going to just remind you that this is not the end of things right here. We are not in the land of the living going to the land of the dying. We're in the land of the dying going to the land of the living. One of these days, it's going to be goodbye world, goodbye. And when that happens to you, the greatest thing that's going to be true about your life is that you have a relationship with God, that you're going to heaven, that you're with the king. And Jesus said, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So when life crushes you, when life destroys you, when life puts the hammer on you and does everything to kill you, James says you can be exalted in the fact that there's something greater than what people think about you and how much money you have, that you're part of the kingdom of God. So let the lowly brother be exalted. And then he says that on the flip side, the brother that has everything, it's good when he gets humiliated every now and then. You know why? I mean, you know why. Because the same thing happens to you. When you have everything you need, does God have a lot of influence in your life? Well, not most of the time. Now, I know, you know, there are some of you that are wonderful Christians and you're very mature and you, the Lord has a part in your life at all times. And even though you may have a lot and, and you don't need very much, but it's because, you, it's because you've had a lot of pirates come along in your life, right? It's because you've learned a lesson, right? Yeah. Yeah, but most of the time, when we have everything we need, everybody say prosperity. Okay, chicken in every pot, two cars in the garage, nobody's repossessing anything. You know, I got plenty of groceries in the shelves. My children are doing okay at school, and, and, and life is good. It's very difficult to see your need for God because you have everything. I remember Wesley talking about the mission trip that he went on this past year. And they went to a very ritzy, rich place to do Bible school. And the little kids came to Bible school and learned about the Lord all week long. And then at the end, they always had the parents come in and look at what they did all week long. And the parents of these little rich kids just basically showed up out of obligation to their kids. They had no interest in anything to do with Christ, anything to do with the church, anything to do with, 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 with anything like that because they didn't feel like they needed it. So James says, when you have everything you need, that's a real curse because you don't know you need the Lord. And so whenever... A, a prosperous brother is humiliated. Be happy about that because now, like Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, it's, you're blessed when God knocks you down and you can see your real need for him because that allows you to come to him. Otherwise, you're going to walk away, never even coming to God because you don't need him in life. So, it seems like double talk, but we face the trial of poverty, and we face the trial of plenty, and we go through it. Let the lower, lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because that's the flower of the field, which is just an illustration. You, you, you can see this in your mind, a word picture just in your mind, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes, so the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. This just means, look, just like a, you look at a flower, you pick it, the sun, you know, it's got a beautiful face. It has lovely petals. It is, uh, it is uh, moist and, and, and well uh, presented, and it looks great, and, and you are admiring its beauty, and it's wonderful, but just as soon as the old hot Judean sun begins to hit this thing, uh, the, the leaves the, begin to fade and begin to, to foil, and, and the face, you know, the beautiful face and presentation of this thing begins to dry up and wither up. And, 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 and before you know it, that that once was wonderful and glorious and beautiful and all of that is now just a dried up piece of weed. James says, that's how prosperity is in life. About the time you, you begin to admire it, it disappears. If you're trusting in being always prosperous, your prosperity dries up like a, like a wilted flower in the Judean sun. 
So don't think that your prosperity is something you can count on and glory in and it's going to take you to heaven or make a difference in your life because just as soon as it came, it can leave that way because that's how prosperity is. And don't tell me you hadn't experienced some of this where you had it good. Boy, it was wonderful. You had lots of resources. You had it coming in. You had it going on. And then all of a sudden... Pirates started coming into your life and taking a little of this and taking a little of that and showing up a little over here. And now you're struggling. That's how fast prosperity goes away. So don't get caught believing it, James says. Blessed is the man who endures testing. Whether you're going through the trial of poverty or the trial of plenty, it's going to be a real trial for you. This is not playtime. This is the truth. That it doesn't matter which one you're going through. It's going to be a real test. But when you make it through, it's going to do something in your life. It's going to, it's going to, to, to have an effect down here on earth and in heaven. Look, uh, for when he has been approved, he'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them who loved him. So in other words, it's not only doing you good here by taking you through and making you strong and giving you options and, and stabilizing your life and making you strong. It's giving you, it's getting you a reward in heaven. It's getting a crown in heaven. You know, there are five crowns that we're going to receive in heaven, right? Yeah, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of life, the crown of, uh, let's say, sacrifice, the crown of triumph. Uh, there, there are five that, that we receive. The martyr's crown for those who preach the gospel and give themselves to the Lord. I mean, we, we earn crowns, and believe it or not, one of these days when we stand in heaven, the thing that you're going to be most excited by is your ability to lay something at Jesus' feet. Now, I know you're going, oh, man, that doesn't sound exciting to me. Yeah, you know why? Because you're still carnal. You're still thinking with an earthly mind. An earthly mind is basically gimme, 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 gimme. An earthly mind is I want what makes me feel good. The difference between a carnal mind, an earthly mind, and a heavenly mind will be that when we get to heaven, the only thing our mind will want is to please him. And to honor him. And so when I have like three or four crowns on and he comes down the avenue of heaven, I'm just picturing in my mind. I don't even know uh, whether, you know, that'll have us a parade or whatever it is. But when I stand before him and, and there's an opportunity for me to lay something at Jesus' feet, which will give me more joy than anything you can imagine, I don't have just like the crown of life, which is one little crown that I get because I'm saved. Everybody gets like the crown of life because you, you, you know the Lord. But here I got another crown. I got the martyr crown. I got the crown of righteousness. You know, I got, I got the rejoice crown. I, and, and I can lay more than one at his feet. And that gives me great joy. So once I endure these tests, see, this is stuff that I need to know. Because if I know these things, when something comes into my life, I can be joyful about the fact that it's come into my life. And these are the kind of things I learn when I ask God for wisdom about, the, about what's happening in my life. You say, what would God tell me? Stuff like this right here. And then somebody evidently jumps up in the crowd, which was not an uncommon practice in that day, and said, hey, James, I'm not being, I'm not being tested by God. I'm being tempted by God. God's tempting me. And James said, you better sit down and be quiet. You don't know what you're talking about because God doesn't tempt anyone. Never say that. Never believe that. I tell you what the devil tries to get us to believe when we're going through hard times. When we're going through tough times, the devil tries to convince you that God doesn't care about you and that God is punishing you and that if you had done right, this wouldn't be happening to you, that this is a result of the fact that you're not living right or you didn't say the right thing or make the right choice. And the devil says, I'm telling you, God cares nothing about you or God knows nothing about you or God is punishing you. That's what begins to pop into our beady little earthly minds because the enemy feeds that, feeds that thought, feeds that thought, feeds that thought. And James says, look, you need to get this straight. 
And you need to understand this once and for all. God does not operate that way. God does not put bad things into your life. I'm talking about sinful things. I didn't say he didn't put unpleasant things in your life. Everything from God doesn't have to be pleasant as distinguished from sinful. God does not put sinful things in your life. They may not be pleasant. They may not be enjoyable, but they're still good. Am I right about this? You understand what I'm saying, right? Man, there are lots of things that come into my life that are unpleasant, that are not comfortable for me. But they're not sinful, so God's not putting sin in my life and an opportunity to sin to test me. No, no, no. James says, don't believe that. That's not how God operates. God is not two-faced. God is not judgmental. God's not fickled. You know, he doesn't say one thing out of one side of his mouth and then act another way out of the other side. God is consistent. And, and, and let no man say when I'm tempted, because God can't be tempted, and he's not going to use temptation to tempt you either. God is foreign to temptation. That is not how God operates at all. But each one is tempted. But there is such a thing as temptation when we're drawn away by our own desires and enticed. You know what, you know, you, you know what tempts us? Our own lust. The things we desire most in life. This is what, this is what tempts us. This is what the devil uses to draw us away to encourage us to sin. Yeah, like a fisherman, you know. I mean, it, 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 it gives you the idea then when the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it's full grown brings forth death. I mean, it, 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 it's, you know, LSD, lust, sin, and death. It's, it's, a, it, it's like this. It's like a fisherman puts a lure on an end of a fishing line why? Because he knows that whatever fish are in that particular pond right there, they're going to be attracted to that. Why? Because they want it. They want it. See, the devil knows what lure to put to your pond. I mean, if you need to be admired because you are prideful, then he's going to put the lure of pride or admiration out there on that lure, and he's going to pop it in in front of you, and he's going to move it just right so it's the most tempting thing it can possibly be, hoping that you will bite that thing and he can lure you in, and you end up in a pot of hot grease for us all over with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're fishing ponds all over the place. Some of them have flashing lights on them, enticing you to come in. Some of them have beautiful faces and wonderful skin. Some of, them, some of them have piles of money. Whatever it is you desire, whatever you lust after, the devil knows the weakness of you, and he's going to dangle what you desire most of all in front of you, enticing you to choose him and make a poor choice and hurt your life. That's what the devil does, not God. God does not take advantage of your weakness. God does not try to entice you to do evil and to be wrong. God entices you toward the good. So James says, look, uh, make no mistake about it, my brother who stood up in the back and said, you're, you're being tempted by God. You don't understand what it is. Get it straight. Now, he's going to keep on talking about it. Let me just move on here. Don't be deceived. <clears throat> so he's saying, okay, get this and get it straight. I mean, put it on a roadside at the middle, a road, a road sign in the middle of an intersection, a busy intersection. Get this settled in your heart is literally, don't be deceived. Every good gift. What kind of gift? Good. good. Uh, every good gift and every, what kind of gift? Perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. In other words, James says, get it straight. Bad stuff comes from the devil and entices you to sin, lures you out of your own lust. And good stuff comes from God. 
God gives only good stuff. Now, I'm going to distinguish, I'm saying God gives good stuff, not unpleasant stuff, like I said a moment ago. I mean, because something unpleasant can be good, right? I mean, if it's working to the good of your life, you you don't like it. It's not comfortable for you. You wish that it wasn't that way, but it's leading you to a greater thing in life. That's unpleasant. It's not sinful. It's unpleasant, but it's still good, even though it's unpleasant because it's leading you to God. So James says, get it straight, man. I mean, you got to get this settled. If, it, if it's bad, it comes from the devil. If it's good, it comes from God. And God never gives anything that's bad. There is no shadow in God. There's no variation in shadow. There's not even a one degree tilt of God or turn of God. God is always consistent. He is always true. He's always right. And he does it every time. So don't be standing up back there saying God's tempting you. God doesn't do that. God gives only good things. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be kind of first. God brought us out of himself. Why? So that we could kind of be a a first fruits. We could be the crown of of his creation. We could be be the, the, the rulers of his creation here on earth. We're kind of a first fruits. We get, to, we, get to, we get to reflect the image of God. Out of his own will, he did this. God chose to do this. Man, that it might be a kind of first fruits. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. That's good news for us, right? Because most of us are just the opposite of that. We're swift to speak and slow to hear, right? <laughs> And quick to get mad about things. The reason you get mad about things is because you don't listen. Because you love to talk. You just keep talking when you ought to be listening. And the more you talk, the madder you get. If you'd listen some, that anger might cool down. That wrath might, might absorb itself. But because we like to listen, because we like to talk so much, we think that time is wasted if, if the air is not filled with the melodious sound of our voice. Then we, we stay mad about a lot of things and we don't get corrected and we don't hear things the way they are. We just, we're wild and woolly. So when God moves in our life, we don't really hear it for the wrath of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. And remember we talked about this, how to receive the word of God and suffer and receive it quickly. Yeah, be swift to hear. Receive it quietly. Be slow to speak. Uh, Calmly. uh, Slow to wrath. Uh, Purely. uh, Receive, move that overflow of wickedness out of your life and be pure before God. And then meekly. Meekly doesn't mean weakly, does it? Meek is not weak. There are only two men in the Bible that are called meek. Jesus was one of them and Moses was the other one. And I don't think Jesus or Moses was ever weak. Meek means strength under control. Meek means I have the power to destroy you, but I'm, I'm under control of something that is greater, and I'm not going to destroy you even though I can. But thank God Jesus was meek. Because when they stuck that spear in his side, he could have destroyed the world. When they spat on him and called him a fake and a phony messiah, He could have gotten mad about that. If he wasn't under control, his strength would have destroyed this world. So what is James saying? You you got to control yourself. Your strength will blow things up. You got to control. So that's how you hear the word of God in suffering. And he compares the, the word of God to a strong root. In other words, all of us have the word of God in our hearts. There are things you memorize, things that are true in your heart, things that are there, uh, and you and 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 they're like a like a root. Have you have you ever seen anything that's been grafted? Have you, have you ever noticed any? I mean, if you're, are there any farmers or husbandmen or something like that? You know, vine dressers, and do we have anything like that around? If you've seen, yeah, if you've seen things grafted, what it means is something that's not normally there 
is placed into something else so that it becomes a part of that, like, a, like a, the branch of, a, of, of one vine is, is a little slit is created and a branch is stuck in there and it's wrapped tight. And before long, this branch, which is, was not part of this now, is like a, a limb growing out and it's, it's all healed over and it's really being supplied by the original vine. I mean, that's grafted. The Word of God, here's what it, it's saying. The Word of God that grafts itself to us has the power to change our lives. That's what it's saying. Now, I'm asking you, has the Word of God engrafted to your life? I mean, it, what, what part of the Word of God has grafted into your life? I mean, what, what is it that you remember? What is it that your life rides on? What is it that flows in and out of you? When, when tough stuff happens, what kind of words from God begin to come into your spirit and into your heart? That's the word that has engrafted itself. And when it engrafts, then it has the power to help you. That's why I keep encouraging you. Man, every Bible study that, that we have, come on and get in it. Why? Because you'll learn something that will become a part of your life that will engraft itself in you so that when bad things happen or when tests come and those pirates come up on the horizon, you've got something in you that's powerful enough to fight and stand against that thing. So it's the Word of God that grafts itself. It's not just any word. It's the Word that grafts itself to you that changes you. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. So the word of God is, is like a strong root. The word of God is like a mirror. That's just saying basically um, a man in a hurry. Uh, looking at a sorry mirror that's not reflecting very well, uh, goes past, and then when he gets over here, he quickly forgets what he even looked like. So the Word of God is not only a strong root that engrafts to you, the Word of God's like a mirror that reflects who you really are. But you, you, you can't just run by. You know, you have to stop and look. And it can't be old cloudy, uh, you know, piece of brass, shiny, or a piece of tin, which is what mirrors in James' day were. I mean, it, it will reflect, it will show you yourself if you will stop and look. And, and then you can remember, it'll not go away so that you'll have a real idea of the real you. I mean, don't you really want to know what you are before you go to heaven? I mean, before you stand the Lord, before you stand before the Lord, let me just say it that way. Before you stand before God one day, wouldn't you like to know that you're real? Because when you stand before him, it's too late. Look at your neighbor and say, it's too late. What did Jesus say in, in Matthew? That many are going to cry out to him? I'm quoting now Jesus. In that day, many will cry out and say, Lord, Lord. Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we heal the sick in your name and do all mighty works in, the, in your name? And Jesus is going to look at them and say, Depart from me, you worker of sin, for I never knew you. Not I knew you once and you got away. Not I knew you one time, but you got so goofy I let you go. But I never knew you. You deceived yourself. You said, I knew you, but I'm telling you, I never knew you. What will tell you whether he knows you or not? James says, what will tell you whether he knows you or not is the word of God and these pirates of life and how you respond and, 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 and the fact that you don't quit and lay down and walk away and say the heck with it, you know. And, I mean, that you hang in there and, and, you, and you hold on to God and, you, and you're true and right and, strong and strength in God. That'll let you know how real you are. And James says, this is what, this is what trials do in your life. That's what these pirates that pop up are good for. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a forgetful and is not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. In, 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 in other words, the, the uh, words compared to a perfect law, and I, I know you remember all about that, but just to uh, say one word about it, a law is intended to make things better. It's not intended to restrict now, you hear me when I say this. Now, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to quit, all right? 
We'll just pick up here and we back in. Are we back in, James? All right, we're back in, James. We got it going, right? You, 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 you hear the direction here. You, you remember this, right? Okay, so we're ready to move on. But, but, but hear me on this one thing, and then I'm going to quit so y'all can relax, all right? I know it's time to leave. All right, a law, anytime a law is given, a law is intended to open things up is intended to make life better, easier. A law is not intended to restrict things. It might sound restrictive, like drive only on the right side, right-hand side of the road. That sounds like that's a restriction. But you know what that law is intended to do? That law is intended to allow us to be free. Free what? from what? free from getting out on the road and killing our crazy self and not being able to come back to church tonight, you know? <laughs> if I want to be free to live another day and drive around, the law says everybody stay on the right-hand side of the road. Not intended to restrict you. It's not intended for you to say, well, bless God, these roads are paid for by my taxes. And since I paid my taxes and build these roads, I can go anywhere I want to go. See, if that's your attitude, you're going to kill yourself or somebody else. You must obey the law that's not intended to take away your fun, but intended to make it where everybody can survive and live a happy life. That's all it's saying. And James says that's what the Word of God is to your life. The Word of God is not a bunch of rules and restrictions and requirements that are intended to rob you of the joy of life. The Word of God is intended to give you liberty to live life the way God designed life to be lived. So that's the Word of God. Don't be afraid of the Word of God. Don't be afraid of the law of God. The perfect law of God brings liberty, not restriction. Just the opposite of what the world says today. Can't go to church, there's too many rules. All they talk about is money, 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 money. All they want to do is control somebody's life. Can't do this. Can't do that. Yeah. That's the way the world talks about Christianity and about the Word of God. Because that's what they think. Here's what I'm going to say to you. The Bible has many more do's in it than it does don'ts. And if you spend time doing the do's, you won't have time to do the don'ts. So, do the do, all right? All right, stand your feet.